So next up, we have uh, Matt Machen. He co-leads the digital health software team at the University of Manchester. Matt's talking about what is co-design and why you should use it. Thanks very much and good morning, everybody. So um, I'm Matt Machen. I co-lead the digital health software team at the University of Manchester. And my team develops smartphone apps, web-based interfaces and server software for a range of health research projects. And today I'm going to give a talk about co-design. So the areas I'm going to cover today, a bit about what is co-design, um, what are the benefits of using co-design, um, how best to make it work, or at least in our experience, how we have made it work, and some of the difficulties that you might face and some potential solutions. OK, to start off, um, this is quite a big question. What is co-design? It's quite a, a developing approach and developing area and it's used in a wide range of spaces not just in software but in in all sorts of other areas and there is not one consistent definition um, so you probably see a range of different uh, different ways of describing it i like this particular definition here um, which is about attempting to actively involve all stakeholders in the design process to help ensure the result meets their needs and is usable um, so if we step back away from co-design and think about how projects were run in the past, particularly software projects, it was normal to capture requirements from users or collaborators or customers, or whoever we happen to have a relationship with. Um, but co-design takes this quite a bit further. So a key thing here in that first definition is about actively involving the users. So rather than going out to users or customers and and having them passively give you requirements and then going off and implementing the software, it's about actively involving them throughout the whole process and ensuring that their contribution is, uh, is brought in at, at different stages throughout the development. Um, I'm going to be giving examples here from the software side of things, but as I said before, there are a wide range of uses of co-design. So the, the kind of setup that we have in our team and I guess a sort of ideal setup is that we've got a circle and all of the contributors sit on that circle. So we've got the research software engineers or the software engineering team. We've got the users and we've got the research collaborators. So it might be worth me explaining briefly here the kind of setup of the projects that we have. So I, our research collaborators would typically be a clinician or group of clinicians who want to develop some piece of software for a health purpose. And our users are patients or there may also be other clinicians who are going to use our software so that's why we've got these these three different groups and the idea is that, that these three um, groups all work together contributing actively and sharing ideas um, throughout the whole process and it, and there isn't a kind of a, any idea of hierarchy or anything like that so everyone should be be actively involved and contributing equally um, what are some of the potential benefits of co-design? So if you can make it work, a more equitable relationship means that users can become much more actively involved and you get a wider spectrum of views and input. Um, it enables you to get some real world experience. So if you're working in the health domain, there is no substitute for speaking to people who have a particular health condition to get a better understanding of of the software that you're developing and how you can best meet their needs. Um, it, it can feel a bit more engaged or should feel a bit more engaged than some of the more tokenistic approaches of, well, I'll just run a, a workshop or two and that will tick the box to please the funder that I've done some engagement. And ideally, you would get a closer match here between what the users need and what is actually developed. So you've brought the users into the, to the process throughout and they're, they're actively contributing at all stages rather than um, just developing the software and then shipping out to the users and see how they get on with it. And my final point here is that increasingly, certainly in the health space, we're finding that funders expect it. So they expect you to, to take a very active role in involving users in what you're developing. How to make co-design work? So again, co-design is, is a big area of work. Um, 
I'm going to give examples here based on our own experience, which is from the healthcare domain. Um, they may or may not exactly apply in the spaces that you're working, but hopefully some of the, the, the approaches and learning will be, will be similar. So I mentioned the, the kind of three groups. So we've got our research software engineering team. We've got our users, which would often be patients. And we've got our clinicians or clinical researchers. So it's important to get all of those people in to the, to the uh, involved in the project and try and get a mix of clinicians or clinical researchers and people with lived experience. I think there's a danger here in, particularly if it's a clinically led project, having lots of clinicians and then a relatively small contribution from users and you can end up with a slightly imbalanced setup. So I think it's quite important to make sure you, not necessarily got equal numbers, but you've got enough of both sets of, of those people to make a, a significant contribution. And in terms of recruiting people, you could either establish a group to engage people with co-design activities, a new group, or you might look to existing groups. So if you are doing um, research into severe mental illness, and that's the software that you're developing, there will probably be some existing user groups that you can tap into to get access to people to, to contribute to your research. And I'll talk a little bit more in a more, bit more detail about this later, but if you are bringing people in, and you probably will be in the case of patients, without a significant research experience, it's helpful to give them some training at the start. It's all about bringing about this more equitable relationship. If you've got a professor who's a, an expert in research, and you bring in somebody as a patient who's never worked in research before, you need to do something to kind of address that balance. Um, so in terms of how to make it work, establishing the team early, and getting everyone involved. So um, I'm sure on the RSC side of things, we've all experienced the, oh, I've got this grant that's been funded. Can you now come along and do, do your software? It's exactly the same with co-design. You don't want to um, get your grant funded and then say after the, after the fact, oh, well, let's go and get some patients and get them to contribute. You want everyone contributing at the, at the beginning. And think carefully about how to best engage with the different stakeholder groups. So some people might like a focus group type approach where there are multiple people. Other people might be more comfortable in individual sessions or individual interviews and, and find that way of contributing. Um, and then when you're actually running the project, think carefully about how often you want to meet, how long you should meet for, whether to do online versus face-to-face. -face. So if you do online, certainly during COVID, what we found is that, that opens this up the, the number of people you can access because you're not relying on your local area. Um, but at the same time, there can be some advantages to a slightly more interactive face-to-face -face session. So it might be that using a mix of those approaches would work. Again, think about your, your particular group. And thinking about who should facilitate these groups is important. So if, you want, if you've got a clinically-led research project where the, the lead person is a, a clinician and they facilitate the sessions, you're already creating another power imbalance within the group. So perhaps using an independent facilitator puts the clinicians and the patients on a more equal footing. And consider what aspects of the design process are most important to co-design. So in the area that I work, we're working with clinicians who are fully occupied with their day jobs and patients they're not the sort of people who are going to actively involve, get involved in writing the software. If you're working in a different area where you're assisting researchers um, who already do some software development, you know, if you're in the maths modeling area that um, Neil was talking about this morning, or if you're maybe in a more scientific space, you might think about doing co-design and the actual software development. In our case, we haven't done that because the people we're co-designing with don't have that expertise. So we focus more on things like look and feel of the app and how it's delivered to the patients, um, how they access it, how they get support. Okay, so I've talked quite a bit about how to make co-design work. Now I'm gonna talk through some of the potential problems of which there are a good number. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, there's a few I've highlighted on here and I'll talk through each, each in more turn. So things like participants dropping out and that applies both to clinicians and, and to patients. 
Um, trying to create that equal environment can be challenging. Um, if you're working with particular patient groups, it might not be that easy to engage them in the co-design process. You can also end up, and we have certainly seen this on a number of occasions, with somewhat disruptive participants in your process who have their own agenda that doesn't really align with your project. And taking into account that you will sometimes encounter experts on the patient side, so expert people with lived experience. So going through each of these in turn, Clinicians are busy people and they may um, not have enough time to engage in your project in the way that you want. Particularly if it's a long term three or five year project and you're asking for them to, to be actively involved throughout that time. So some of the things that we've learned here about how to improve that is being very clear on what's expected at the outset. So at the point when you're bringing people on board, being really open with them about what you expect. Think about this level of seniority of the clinicians that you're involving. So if you bring in a really senior clinician, yes, they'll have a lot of knowledge and expertise that they can bring, but equally they're also probably going to be highly in demand and getting their time is not going to be so easy. And one option here is to have a pool of clinicians. So you might bring in three or four perhaps of different levels of seniority um, so that if one or two drop out or aren't always available, you've got other people to cover. And in terms of patients or people with lived experience, they also drop out probably for different reasons. Again, being very clear about the expectations from the outset is, is really important. But you know, if they experience a, a worsening of their health um, or some other life-changing event, it's, it's inevitable they're going to, to drop out. And that's one of the advantages of having a group, either one that you set up or one that you, um, an existing group that you engage with. So you're not relying on a small number of individuals. And also probably accept that if it's a longer term project in the sort of terms of three to five years, that actually bringing people on board throughout the project is probably going to be required. <coughs> so the issue of equality is quite a big one. You, if you have got a professor who's got 30 years experience of running research projects and you're bringing in a patient who has lots of experience of their health condition but maybe has no experience of research at all you are going to have a, a, automatically a power imbalance and you need to try and address that if you want to get equal contributions and, and to improve the process um, so training and support for those people without experience is really important so if somebody's never been involved in research before getting them some basic training on what research is all about, how the process works, um, supporting them throughout, uh, maybe having a designated member of the research team to assist them throughout the process, help them with any questions, help them prepare for meetings, um, provide some guidance on the approaches to all the people who are involved. So that might involve telling your senior clinician to back off a bit so that they don't become overpowering in any of the groups. And again, as I mentioned earlier, think about who facilitates this group. So if you have your, your prof facilitating the group, you're immediately creating an imbalance there and it might be worth having an independent facilitator. And you could also consider having additional groups focused just on those people with the lived experience of the patient so they get to speak and contribute without um, the clinicians and, and senior researchers involved. So sometimes you might be working with a participant group who find it difficult to engage. An example of this is that we previously developed an app for people with dementia. And because of the, some of them were fairly advanced in, the, in the, their condition, and it was difficult there for them to, to become equal members of the research team, it just wasn't realistic. Um, and I imagine that, that that would apply to a number of the health conditions. There are a number of ways to address this. So we, d we used a combination in that project, involving the carers to get a view from um, you know, someone who's living with that person can be really valuable. As I kind of mentioned earlier, make sure that there's the right level of support. So having someone in the research team who is designated to work with this group and actively engage them and support them throughout the process. And so taking on board their contributions in perhaps in different ways, or um, also thinking about how to, to help elicit their, their contributions. And one thing that we have done in, in the past 
is used a member of the research team as a kind of proxy. So we would have a member of the research team go and meet with these people in their own environment, um, get their input, and then they would kind of collate that input and bring it back to a wider discussion. Yes, this is an interesting one, which is something I've experienced quite recently, actually. Disruptive participants with their own agenda. And I don't know whether this happens in other fields, but it certainly happens in healthcare, because you will have somebody who has had a bad experience with the NHS, and they join a research project to kind of vent about that experience, and because they want you to change and fix the NHS. Um, and this can be really quite disruptive, because if you've got someone who's got a strong character and is quite actively engaging, but you're wanting to develop a digital health project and they're talking about how you need to go and change the way NHS care is delivered through the through the frontline clinicians, you know, they're, they're talking about something that's completely outside the scope of what you're going to, to be doing on your project. And it's something that, again, you can't influence. So you can't actually solve their problems. Um, it, this, and it can be quite disruptive because they can sometimes become very dominant in discussions and doesn't give other people the chance to contribute. What, one thing that's worked quite well in the past is just meeting with them separately, going through the project, reminding them what it is that we're trying to achieve and trying to bring them back to focus on, on what's important for our project. Um, if that doesn't work, ultimately, perhaps it's best for the group that you remove that person. And obviously you do that in, in the right way um, so that it's handled sensitively. But if this person is taking up 50% of the time in the group, and other people are not getting a chance to, to contribute, and they're, and they're talking about things that are completely irrelevant, then it might be that ultimately getting, getting them out of the group is the right solution. Okay, and then the final challenge is what I've called expert people with lived experience. So, um, because there's a large number of research projects that take place in, in certainly if you're in a big institution, so at Manchester, or if you're in one of the other big universities, you may find that um, people who are ordinary patients actually gain quite a lot of expertise in research because they've been for many years actively involved in a number of research projects and they gain a, a significant level of expertise. Um, in a way, that's not necessarily an issue. It's fine because they're, they're going to be very able to actively contribute. You're going to get lots of input from them because they've got lots of expertise. But you just need to be aware that when you're thinking about then rolling out your software later, that they maybe don't represent a typical user because they've got a different level of expertise to your average patient. And if you base only on their ideas, you might find that when you roll out your, your app or your other software, that actually the rest of the patient community struggle more because they haven't got the expertise that this person has. And I think one of the solutions here is to, to try and recruit a range of different people. So rather than relying on one or two individuals, have a group, and try and include people with a mix of levels of research experience there. And also think about other types of engagement, so traditional PPI type activities, which are at a different level to the, to the um, more actively involved co-design to bring in that broader perspective. Okay, so some brief conclusions and recommendations. Co-design has the potential to bring benefits to the development of research software. Certainly we've seen significant benefits in, in the health apps that we've developed. Um, it's a very good way to, to get people involved and to get new ideas and broader perspectives. In terms of making it work, get the team together really early, so before you submit the grant rather than later. Think carefully about how to engage with a range of different people and think very carefully about how you can address that power imbalance and the expertise imbalance so to bring about some more equality. And I've talked through a number of challenges here. So recognising that this might be an improvement on traditional passive requirements capture, but it's certainly not perfect. You're going to face some challenges. Think in advance about how you want to handle those. You know, so for instance, if, you, if people are going to drop out, you need to think early on about how to handle that. Otherwise, um, it might be too late by the time that happens. And at, at least, hopefully, it should result in, in software that is more usable, better fits the user's needs, and is therefore more accepted.
by um, the people who ultimately use it. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Great, great show of questions already. Okay, um, co-design can deteriorate deteriorate um, once initial developments get going and users feel they were used and abandoned. How did you avoid that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there is a there is a danger certainly of involving users at the beginning, getting their input, saying thank you very much, and then leaving them in, out in the cold. And the way to do that, I guess, th there are. A, a couple of things. One is you want them to be actively involved throughout. So it's not just after the development gets going, you say bye bye, we don't need you anymore. You want them to be involved in testing the software, um, trying to keep them involved even at the point when the software is finished and you're maybe using it in a clinical trial so that they can um, share experiences. Or if, you, if the users in the trial report problems, you can get the, the input of your, your participants and um, making sure that you regularly feed back to them about how everything's gone, the results from the trial and delivering that in a way that is meaningful to them. Okay. So the next one is, do you think there is a minimum size of a project to use co-design? I would say no, unless it was a really tiny project. You know, um, I don't. I don't think. You know, we've used it on on like an app that might have taken three months to develop, and that sort of scale. Um, so I don't think there's a there's a minimum size. I guess it it depends how you are capturing the requirements from your users and what you are getting out of bringing them into the process. I, I don't think I'd set a, a you know, kind of absolute minimum. Maybe the bigger the project, the more important it is, you know, because you're going to be going out to a wider user base and, and impacting more people, and therefore it's, it's more likely you'd make a mistake in terms of what you develop. But I wouldn't particularly set a minimum size. Thanks. So the next one is, um, how do you relate co-design to Agile, as in the way of doing software projects? Okay, so we certainly use Agile in our team. So we use Scrum um, as our software development methodology. And um, there are different ways of, in, of bringing in co-design into that, depending on how frequently you can access the other members of the group. So the participants, the users, and the, um, the research team or the clinicians. So if you can access them very frequently, you could consider, and we have done this on occasions, bringing into the, them into your scrum planning and review meetings to get their, their contribution directly. If they are more busy and unable to engage quite so often, then you should be taking the co-design output from the, those discussions and then using that to feed in, perhaps less directly, but feed in um, into your, your sort of planning and review discussions. And you might therefore use a single representative to act as a product owner or some kind of similar role. Great. We'll keep going as long as we've got time. Um, how do you address the burden of volunteer time for participants? And do you consider compensation maybe even factored into the grant? Yeah, so in terms of um, patients or users who are not clinicians, then they certainly get compensated. So there would be payments made for their contribution and there are standard guidelines around how much you should pay for the number of hours that you ask of somebody. Um, so they certainly get compensated. Clinicians is more diff difficult because they're kind of expected to do it as part of their job, but at the same time, they're not sure of other things to do. You can't usually give direct financial compensation um, but we have tried to do other things like uh, maybe arrange a uh, discussion around a lunch or something like that and provide lunch so you can do a kind of in a slightly more indirect benefit for clinicians. Um, how do you balance uh, the software development or tech challenges like refactoring with user facing demands? Um, and how does that relate to the co-design experience? 
Okay, so certainly refactoring and improving the software needs to happen in any project and it happens just as much in a, in a project where you've got co-design as any other. Um, and when you're doing your planning and we do our planning in an agile way, you need to be think carefully about what's realistic in terms of what you can deliver in the time, time and resources you've got available. Um, and that can sometimes mean saying no to a user requirement because there is an important technical improvement you need to make in terms of either refactoring the software or changing technology stack or things like that. Um, how do you surface that in the co-design experience? I think being transparent about the fact that there's a need to improve the software. Um, that can be challenging in the early phases of developing a new relationship because you've got some clinician who just wants the benefit for their users. Um, but I think over time, once you, as you develop that relationship and there's some trust comes into it, they recognize that you need to build something that's going to last and therefore you've got to put effort into both the, the user experience side of things and the underlying tech. Okay, one final question. Um, do you find you focus more on asking open questions, like what um, in general do you need the app to do, or do you focus more on concrete options uh, in terms of feedback from the co-design group? So I would say it's a mixture. Um, earlier in the process, we'd use a lot more open questions to try and elicit ideas and um, get a wider spectrum of views as we start to move forward then we would tend to tailor those um, questions a bit more to constrain around particular things we want to get concrete feedback on. And actually one of the things we do, which kind of ties into the previous talk, is that we have a UI UX designer who produces functional prototypes. So as we get into maybe the second or third iteration, we'd actually be taking a longer prototype to get people to look at. And that tends to help to steer and tailor some of the, the discussion and the questions. Great. Thanks, let's thank Matt again.